The next layer down is campaigns. So campaigns, each business needs to be running campaigns. Um, so uh, I have three campaigns that I recommend. So at a very baseline, sales-driven campaign is what we call the perfect repeatable week. Um, and that is basically, we every single week we do things that generate leads, end up as appointments, present a value proposition, and then make sales, right? So we call that our weekly laps, leads, appointments, presentations, and sales. Um, and we have campaigns that are specifically designed to generate leads this week, book into appointments this week, have a presentation and a sale either this week or next, and it's like laps, 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 laps. Daniel, you're very welcome to the Scale X Insider podcast. Delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. So good to be on the show. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Really, really looking forward to the conversation. You know, uh, and we're very aligned on this, our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small to medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So Daniel, what does scaling with purpose mean to you? So for me, that's everything. We live in a time where, you know, entrepreneurship is the dominant force on the planet for solving meaningful problems. So for me, scaling with purpose is a couple of things. Number one, it's the bedrock of the business. So I think businesses exist to solve meaningful problems in the world. That's why they exist. Um, so there's the nature of what you do. Um, there are businesses that by their nature are good for the world, they solve meaningful problems, and there are businesses that are by their nature bad for the world, right? So for example, OnlyFans is a, is a terrible business. Um, and, you know, that is uh, taking advantage and exploiting people, um, and it's lying about its numbers, and it's trying to create a, uh, a narrative that will ultimately ruin people's lives or many people's lives, right? So the nature of that business is a is a terrible business. That's not a business you want to be in. And then there are other businesses that the nature of what they do is uh, solving meaningful problems, supporting people, empowering people, uh, making um, you know ma making positive dents in the universe. So ideally, what we want to do is pick a meaningful problem that needs solving, not just an easy way to make money. Um, and then the next thing that I think is important is just the way that you run the business. So, you know, we, do we need to run every single decision through the filter of short-term profit? Probably not. Um, do we want to run decisions through a filter of, um, is this the right way to run the business uh, for everyone involved? Um, and, you know, it's it's not impossible. And it's also not um to the detriment of the business, you know, you can actually, the, the, the times that we're in right now, you can run super successful businesses that are good for the world, um, that are run really well for, for everyone involved. And I'm not talking, I'm, by the way, I'm not talking about being like some super woke little, you know, nut, nuthead who, you know, gets offended by everything and all this sort of stuff. And who's on a crusade to virtue signal. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just just being a good, solid business that's doing good things in the world. Here, here. I absolutely love that. Daniel, look, there's lots of places we can go today. We were chatting before we came on air. Your experience in starting up, scaling up and, and selling up is, is extensive. So I, I want for those who are not maybe as familiar as I am with your work, and with your journey, just to share, to give some context for what's happening in the present day uh, to your early entrepreneurial journey. And, and, and I'm particularly curious to draw out the importance of mentorship in, in, in those early stages. So where I am today, I run a group of companies. At the center of the group is an entrepreneur accelerator that runs globally. Um, and, you know, we are a scale up business ourselves. We're a global, global business, global team. Um, and we've been going for 13 years and largely that business is all about developing entrepreneurs who stand out, scale up and make a positive impact in the world. So it's called Dent Global. Um, it's an entrepreneur accelerator that I, um, that I set up in 2010. Great name, by the way. Yeah. It's based on the Steve Jobs quote to make a dent in yeah, the universe. Love it. Um, and then surrounding that business, we have uh, B2B service companies that um, support the ecosystem. So um, we now have one of the biggest nonfiction publishers in the UK um, called Rethink Press. We've got an amazing awards accelerator or awards business um, called August Recognition. 
Um, we've got um, a tech company, tech services called So, uh, so Technology. Um, uh, so uh, we've got a business um, that does capital fundraising for startups, early stage fundraising called Robot Mascot. Um, we've got some Facebook ads um, and Google ads with the growth guys. We've got SEO agency called Jammy Digital. We've got an agency in the Philippines called 2XU, which does um, support staff. So we've got this group of growth services companies um, in, the, in there. So there's six or seven companies um, sitting around that. And then there's a couple of tech startups. So Score App is an amazing technology company um, that's grown to a, a multi-million pound revenue in a few years. Um, it's, a, it's a tech business that has AI enablement built into it. It's winning awards. It's um, scaling at about seven to ten percent month on month. Wow. Um, so this wow. month alone, we set up, uh, we signed on thirty five hundred new clients. Um, so more than a hundred a day on average from twenty nine different countries on uh, around the world. Um, and then BookMagic.ai just launched. Um, so it's AI tools for authors uh, to help them write better books. Uh, not writing the book for them, but just supporting the whole process. So essentially there's tech, there's services, and there's training. In terms of your early days, uh, we were speaking off air and, and part of my research, I discovered the importance of mentorship. And there were, there were three lessons that you gleaned as a kind of a 19 year old, 20 year old, 21 year old working with this guy called John, who's become uh, infamous as, as part of um, you evangelizing about your, your early career to the world. Uh, can you share a little bit of that? And then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll, we'll build up to a uh, score app, which I know you're incredibly yeah. passionate about. So John had a very positive influence on me. I was I was a dropout of university at 19. I went and worked for John. He was 37. Um, and John was a very successful entrepreneur uh, onto his next company. Um, I was employee number three. And um, two years later, we had 60 people on the team with multi, multi-million revenue. Um, and I was just super fortunate to be kind of under John's wing uh, on most days. So for two years, I worked you know, in the next office to John and spent a lot of time traveling because um, we were opening offices in, or we were opening up in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. So we were kind of like traveling a fair bit together. Um, and yeah, he was just a great mentor. You know, he taught me a lot about marketing and mindset. So, you know, one of the, one of the marketing lessons was everything's downstream from lead generation, that lead generation is super important. Um, he, you know, he would basically talk about how do you build a brand? Well, you sell the product to someone and they have a good experience with it. So when you're starting up, the brand is just lead generation and sales like <laughs> and, and doing the right thing. Um, and he, he made the key, key point to me, which is if you're incredibly good at what you do, but you're not very good at lead generation, you're going to become very bitter and frustrated really fast. Um, if you're not very good at what you do, you haven't got a great product or service yet, but you're very good at lead generation, you can fix everything as you go. So you can always have salespeople, you can always hire consultants, you can always fix things if the leads are flowing, you can raise money if the leads are flowing. So lead generation is where it all starts. And um, he gave me a lot of lead generation ideas um, when, when, we, when we launched. Um, and mind you, this is like year 2000 type thing. Um, and then, any of those still relevant today, Daniel, and we'll get into that whenever we come into, uh, um, oversubscribe, the, but the principles are still relevant, but the tactics have changed. So the principles of hooking attention, communicating a value proposition in a sentence or two, those couldn't be more relevant. Um, uh, naming the frustration, uh, creating frustration hooks, uh, all of those sorts of things, incredibly relevant calls to action. Um, you know, all of that and having a, having a repeatable process, perfect repeatable weeks, um, you know, those, those sorts of things, PR, PRWs, perfect repeatable weeks. Um, and then the tactics have massively changed. So we used to use newspaper ads a lot. We used to use direct mail in the, in the physical mail. We even did fax broadcasting, um, you know, so all of those tactics have dead, completely died off, but the same 
philosophies and principles work on TikTok. Um, so, uh, you know, the, well, the, the, the essence is there. We'll get into that. I interjected. So um, everything is downstream from lead generation, kind of the first lesson from John. What yeah. else? Um, so perfect repeatable weeks. So one of the first things we did was sit around the kitchen table with a massive Sasco year planner, big cardboard uh, wall chart. And we actually built the year that would get us to our target. So we spent probably all afternoon with looking at the year ahead and just working out exactly what we would do week by week. Mind you, most weeks were going to be the same. So we, we built a perfect repeatable week and we overlaid that. And we had these campaign cycles of building up to key moments and then like intensifying the sales efforts and then uh, having rest periods. And so we built the whole year before we started and we probably took three or four hours to do that. And then that was the year we, we, we executed on that. And what were you um, selling? So it was a performance marketing agency. Um, and essentially you take a traditional old business that's taken its eye off the prize with sales and marketing and you bolt on as a front end partner for that business. So that was the business model. The business model um, was, was essentially that. So lead generation, perfect repeatable weeks, any other important lessons from- The other from... lessons were mindset related. So, you know, John did this thing where he asked me um, how much I thought was a lot of money because he was going to put me into a sales performance role um, in, at one point. And he asked me, how much do you think is a lot of money? And my answer was a grand a week. Like there's not much you can't do on a grand a week. So if I, I said to him, if I could earn 52,000 in a year, that would be mind blowing. Um, and he said, well, your target has to be a hundred grand a month of sales, which means you are going to be on 10% fee, uh, commission only. Um, so you're going to earn 10,000 a month or I'm going to fire you. And I was kind of like mind blown by this idea. Um, I averaged about 12 grand a month that year, um, which was pretty, pretty wild, um, as in my commissions. So I, I probably earned 120 to 140,000 that year. Um, which to me, I'd never earned more than say 1500 in a month. Um, so it was a massive growing year, but one of the things he did to get me acclimatized to money was he made me carry a couple of grand in my pocket. Uh, so he, he basically got me to get a cut my hands on a couple of thousand dollars, um, which was pretty much my entire net worth. And, um, in fact, it was more than my net worth. It was my net worth plus some debt. <laughs> Right. Um, so I, I put this in a bulldog clip and I carried it in my pocket. Um, and it totally was wild. Like I remember just, I can actually mentally feel it in my hand, in my pocket. And I can almost remember the um, clothes that I would wear because it was such a visceral high intensity experience having that money in my pocket. Uh, so I would, I would clutch onto it and, um, and I'd check it a hundred times a day to see that it was still there. And uh, anyway, that was that was a massive mindset shift because what happened to me over the course of a couple of months was that a couple of grand went from all the money in the world to just pocket money. Um, so it was an amazing experience. And when I was doing sales, my nonverbal communication asking people for a couple of grand was like asking them for a kidney. And then a couple of months later, my nonverbal communication was, hey, this is totally normal, totally reasonable, no big deal. It's pocket um, change. Yeah, pocket change. Yeah, exactly. So it was a, it was a great shift. That, I mean, that's incredible for 37-year-old John to be as wise uh, to take you on as a college, uh, a college dropout at 19 and yeah. kind of take you under his wing and mentor you in the way that you have been mentored. I mean, the wisdom in the last five minutes alone is just <laughs> profound. Um, what was John's source? You know, did he hand you things to read to say, look, that's my Bible, you know, you know, study that. And uh, John, so by the way, John's gone on to be worth over a hundred million. Um, and he's, he's very, very successful. He's built a massive property portfolio and he's got, you know, he's a great guy. Uh, we're still friends. Um, but basically John's office was just full of books and he really encouraged me to gra grab books and, and he would hand me books. So while we were traveling, he got me into journaling more than uh, reading. 
like, yes, I was reading books. Yes, we would listen to Tony Robbins together and all those kind of CDs and cassette tapes. Um, when John would listen to a Tony Robbins cassette tape, he would listen to three minutes of it and just stop and journal and listen to another three minutes and he'd write down and he was analyzing how did Tony hook your attention so quickly. And so we'd listen to these sorts of things. Jay Abrahams, we listened to a fair bit and we'd analyze we'd analyze other companies' marketing materials together and have a look at what was working, what wasn't working. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we really got into, he, he was a great one for buying um, home study kits from different sources. He was kind of buying stuff from the US long before that stuff was in Australia. Yeah, um, Br brilliant. You've worked with thousands of entrepreneurs and you know, you've mentioned Tony Robbins. Uh, it's something that I recall from a, a Tony Robbins interview or one of his books, he talks about the importance of actually managing your state first, uh, which enables your story, your own self story, before you can apply an effective strategy, essentially state story strategy. Given everything that you've done uh, right across the globe, Daniel, what weight would you put on mindset in the context of scaling effectively? So here's what I've noticed. I've noticed that the, every single person, every person, the most brilliant people included, all of us have three settings on our head. Um, and I call it reptile, reptile autopilot and visionary. Um, so you can take, you can take a student who's totally broke and like, you know, sharing five people to a three bedroom house and no money and all that sort of stuff. You can take them for a walk through a really affluent neighborhood and just get walking. And through the process of walking and just being around big, beautiful houses, you watch instantaneously what they believe is possible just suddenly just goes, boom, change. Um, so you take someone who is a massive multimillionaire, right? Someone who's post exit, get them thinking about how easy it is for them to lose their wealth. Get them thinking about how, um, how many, you know, scams are out there. Get them thinking about how many children they've got and how much they have to leave per child and all this sort of stuff and taxes. And suddenly they go into reptile mode and they're just like angry and aggressive and they lose their ability to think expansively. So um, essentially, I think that there are three settings that everyone is pre-hardwired with. You can't turn it off. You can't, you can't ever move past it. You can have reptile moments, autopilot moments, and visionary moments. Um, so reptile is fight, flight, freeze, freak out, um, you know, et cetera. Uh, very constricted thinking, short term, and low IQ. So you lose about 15 points of IQ once you're in reptile. Wow. And then autopilot is just repeat the past. So this is just get into a repetitive um, habit. Uh, you know, we've all had the moments where we've kind of like driven for 15 minutes and like, then you just think, how did I even get here? Like, I don't remember anything about the last 15 minute drive. Um, uh, and then, th and that takes over as well in business. The longer you've been in business, the longer you are just set in your ways and you just cannot move out of, you know, the way you do things. Um, and that's where you need to often shake it up by bringing in some new blood. Um, and then there's visionary and visionary is very expansive thinking. It's, um, I once heard a story about Rupert Murdoch where Rupert Murdoch was asked, how do you build a global business? And he actually said to someone, and I know this firsthand who lived in the same building as him, he said, every night I get a globe, an actual map of the world and I sit and I look at it and I imagine news happening in all the cities on the globe and that stories are happening and things are going on in people's lives and that in every one of those cities is a Murdoch newspaper. Um, and I just imagine that whole business happening globally and I just watch it spinning from out in space and I imagine myself out in space. Um, so that is very much like an activity or a ritual to spark um, expansive visionary thinking. What do you do, uh, given your success to date and your continued success and the, and the way you think I've listened to a lot of your stuff in recent times, 
And, you know, I've been reading your stuff, you know, the way you think is so on one hand, so incredibly practical and relatable, but on another hand, it's kind of fresh and visionary. What, what are you doing uh, to kind of marinate yourself in a way that actually um, is conducive to visionary thinking. And when I, when I think of this, uh, I, you know, I'm fascinated with the work of uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. He talks about if you're not inspired by a vision of the future, then you're directed by the memories of the past. So clearly what you're doing is, um, you know, being inspired by a vision of the future. So, so practically just to share with our listeners, yeah, what, are you, so what are you doing? Very practically, Daniel? there's a reason that I've written so many books. It's because that's how I process. And that's one of my get in the visionary mode moments when I'm writing a book and I'm imagining readers out there I'm taking my best thinking and distilling it and putting it into books and it's that process of thinking about books um, I also have a series of maxims that I use um, that are like my home truths that I share with the team and I embed them into the, our culture and those maxims are really powerful things like you get what you pitch for and you're always pitching um, so you're going to pitch into existence anything that you talk about repeatedly um and the whole team knows that you get what you pitch for you're always pitching um and then there's maxims like somebody woke up with it um so someone woke up with it means that um whatever the resource is that we would want to use someone woke up with it so if we want money someone woke up with it if we want a million person database someone woke up with it um so the that is shorthand for go talk to the person who has the thing um one of my favorite stories of someone woke up with it is when they were making the movie um, Top Gun, they had these models that they built of aircraft carriers and little uh, F-111 fighters. And they were like doing some test filming to see how realistically they could make this thing look. And some junior on the team says, have we spoken to the Navy and asked if we can just use an aircraft carrier? And they're like, well, don't be ridiculous. The Navy's not going to give us an aircraft carrier. And then they pick up the phone, they make a phone call, and the Navy just so happened to be wanting to engage people to join the Navy. And they loved the idea of a Hollywood film with Tom Cruise in it. And they went, yeah, of course. We'll get, what do you want? Do you want jets? Do you want an aircraft carrier? Do you want it out at sea? Do you want it? Like, what do you want to do with it? And someone woke up with an aircraft carrier. And someone, literally, someone woke up and has the keys to an aircraft carrier on them. So if you can have a conversation with whoever owns the aircraft carrier and you want to make a movie about aircraft carriers, provided they get what they want and you get what you want, everyone's happy. So I love this story that someone woke up with an aircraft carrier. Have a, have a chat with them. I mean, if you can talk to the Navy about an aircraft carrier, you know, then it's not that hard to talk to an angel investor about some cash. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. I love that. And it resonates so strongly. I interviewed Dan Sullivan, um, the founder of Strategic Coach, uh, a number of a number of episodes back. And uh, he wrote the, the wonderful book, co-wrote with Benjamin Hardy, uh, uh, Who Not How, that concept of Who Not How, which is I've never I've never heard it couched as someone woke up with it. I love that. Really love that. That really resonates. Any other, those, those maxims are great. You get what you pitched for. Someone woke up with it. Anything else, Daniel? Uh, income follows assets. Um, so income follows assets is that if we, if anything's not working, we have an income, we don't have an income deficient. We have, we have an asset deficiency. So asset deficiency. So for example, if you want premium pricing, you need to win awards or you need to be positioned alongside luxury brands or you need to have more proof of ROI. Um, so we always have this thing of like income follows assets. Look for the underlying asset that produces the result. Don't, don't chase the result, chase the underlying asset of the, of the thing. So if you want rent, first you need a house. If you want dividend checks, first you need the shares. If you want scale, you need scalable digital assets. So it's like the, the income follows the assets uh, is one of our other maxims. So these are things that you affirm on a daily basis then? Uh... Yeah, we train every new recruit on our maxims. Um, uh, so um, yeah, there's, there's just these, these um, maxims that we just kind of run with. And what have you found, you know, that had, what have you find kind of from this 19 year old to fortuitously um, uh, came into this business with with John, the mentor, and you know, 
you know, over the last kind of 30 years, I know I'm, 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 I'm making you older than you are, actually, uh, the, the last kind of 20 odd years, uh, what has what has really stuck with you, Daniel? And you know, in the in the tough times, serves as an anchor. That you know, it kind of in the tough times. And I've heard you talking about the the challenges of the global financial crisis in the past. And you know, but and sometimes in those in those situations of crisis, we forget what has served us in the good times. You know, and we and mm. and and then it, it takes a while to go back to those things. Are are there any things, any practices, any rituals? Uh, other than writing that you practice, which serves as an anchor, uh, always now that's fundamental as part of your yeah, day, the, week, month. The one thing, so a lot of business is paradoxical. So for example, perfect repeatable weeks, you know, getting into doing that. Um, but then on the other side of perfect repeatable weeks, the paradoxical opposite would be expanding the surface area of luck. So, um, if you imagine that luck is like um, a pond and someone's throwing rocks, if the pond is bigger, there's going to be more rocks that end up in the pond, right? So if you can expand the surface area of luck. So for example, um, uh, if you sit at home watching Netflix, that has a very, very low surface. There's a very low chance of luck arising from that mm -hmm. event. You might see something in, like you might watch uh, the Michael Jordan documentary, uh, you know, and get an idea. Maybe that could be a, a, a little bit of luck that could come from watching Netflix, but it's very low likelihood that luck would happen. If instead you went out for, for a networking function with a group of other entrepreneurs and you were um, out and about meeting people, that's a much higher surface area of luck. Um, even just a, if you didn't want to leave the house, if you were what deliberately watching something by an experienced entrepreneur about how to grow a business, that would be a higher surface area of luck. Um, so essentially you want to sort of move towards things that have a high luck surface area that, that basically the, you're not guaranteed that something lucky will happen, but you're, you're certainly more likely to experience luck um in in those areas there's there's lucky and unlucky behaviors there's lucky and unlucky people um and there's a great joke that i love and it's kind of funny which is uh which is when i'm hiring i always take half the cvs and throw them away because i wouldn't want to hire an unlucky person <laughs> uh, right <laughs> which is just a horrible image but it's such a fun it's such a funny thing but it's true there are lucky and unlucky people and um, you can hang around with people who are just constantly unlucky, but eventually you've got to just say, this person just is always unlucky. Um, you know, this is not, this is, this is not where luck is. Then there are other people who they just seem to fall on their feet. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got people in my life who do everything right. They're just unlucky. And I've got people who seem to just stumble through life, but they're always, they're always landing on their feet. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I I like to hang out with lucky people. I like to go to lucky environments. I like to consume content that has a higher surface area of luck. So all of those sorts of things as well. But, you know, th this is the paradox. If you just focus on going out and trying to be lucky, then then that doesn't work. If you just do the perfect repeatable weeks, um, you end up in autopilot and that doesn't work. Um, so you've got to kind of it, it, you know, business is a bit of a paradox in the sense that you are almost walking on a tightrope. And if you lean too far one way, you fall. And if you lean too far the other, you fall. You've got to find that right balance. Completely agree. It comes back, you know, to tie this together. What I'm hearing is, you know, and it's about us changing our states such that we're actually operating in, more in visionary than in certainly than in reptile. There are certain autopilot things that we do that are actually that serve us. There are lots of autopilot things that we need to unlearn that don't serve us. But certainly as as entrepreneurs, as scaling leaders, we want to be operating in that visionary, expansive mindset. And uh, and, you know, luck happens. I, I feel, you know, when uh, when opportunity meets hard work, you've got to get out there. You know, podcast guests just don't happen. Yeah. I interviewed Mark LaRouche. I, you know, I posed the question to Mark, you know, are there any good guests that you feel would, would enjoy this platform? He says, oh, my friend Daniel, you know, and, and these things, uh, you know, I, I just keep happening upon great guests for the show uh, yeah. because you have to ask the question. You have to actually 
um, you know, host the show in the first instance. And, and I've found even the last two years, that surface area of luck has continued to increase. Every but listener you- expands the surface area of luck. Every episode expands the surface area of luck. Um, you know, you talked about hard work and opportunity. Um, there are a lot of people who do hard work uh, as an Uber driver, um, but the opportunity is the wrong opportunity. That opportunity doesn't scale. It's non-scalable. Yeah. There is no compounding to that. Um, whereas someone who is, let's say someone's building a business where they are an affiliate for a CRM system and they use social media to build an audience of, of potential clients. And every time that audience doubles, they double the amount of affiliate commissions they earn, and then they add a second, third, fourth product into their audience, and suddenly they double again and double again, right? And it's like if they were spending, like if the Uber driver spends 14 hours driving Uber, if you were to spend 14 hours dedicated to this scalable opportunity, you know, then you are doing hard work plus plus the right opportunity. Um, so those are, you, you know, those those are two very important things that you need to work hard but also on the right thing so i'm going to come to there because ultimately you have a great knack and skill set of identifying scalable opportunities and that's not by accident that's very much by design and and i want to kind of uh, drill into that a little bit more before i come to that something that i feel um not that i feel something that is absolutely relevant to to all of our listeners you know, you've written four books, four wonderful books. I'm uh, in the middle of oversubscribed at the moment. I encourage uh, if those who are listening can't see that what I'm holding up. I encourage everybody to go out and grab a copy. I've been absolutely engrossed in this book. Um, lead gen is a real challenge for many businesses, and I've even seen this uh, in our in our own business, Simple Scaling, where you know, in many respects, I've spent the last twenty years you know, in scale ups, I have all of this experience now uh, alongside my co-founder and business partner, Claire, you know, we've combined 50 years of of scaling experience. We've created our own um, accelerator. It's a one year accelerator. And there's a little bit of me that says, well, look, if you don't want to come into the accelerator, you know, it's your, it's, it's your, it's your issue. It's not going to change my life, but it's the potential to change yours. So in the early stages, there was a little bit of reticence to actually go out and evangelize about what we're doing and have all of these conversations to try and convince people that this is something they should do if they have ambition to scale their business. Um, I've got over that, but certainly, can you speak to that? Does that does that make sense? And then, how do we then continue back to John's uh, line? You know, everything is downstream for lead generation. Can you share with our listeners how we practically increase our yeah. leads such that we become oversubscribed, Daniel? So you need way more leads than you think. Um, and as your business gets bigger, you need exponentially more leads. So in the early days, you probably only need to talk to 10 to 20 people to make a sale. And then later on, you might need to talk to 40 to 50. And then later on, you might need to talk to 80 to hundred people to make a sale. Um, so you need exponentially more leads. Um, and if we think about why businesses are profitable in the first place, it's because there is an imbalance of demand and supply. So, you know, as a thought experiment, if, um, Ferrari just massively increased production to 2.5 million cars per year, which is about the BMW uh, sort of rate. And um, they, they, they massively, massively increased supply. And uh, ultimately, we know that the price of a Ferrari would have to fall. Um, you know, it would have to come right down to Toyota or BMW levels. Um, it would be the exact same product, but the demand and supply tension would have changed. So the price would come right down. Um, Likewise, if you take a smaller brand like Lotus and suddenly every major celebrity is driving a Lotus, everyone wants the the latest Lotus, everyone's talking about it, millions of people all around the world, they suddenly discover that Lotus is the leading brand. We know that their prices would go up and they'd be more profitable because they don't have the ability to ramp up production as fast as their the 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 demand has roped up so your profitability really is just a function of demand and supply tension 
Um, there is no fairness to it. There's no, there's nothing fair. There's nothing consistent other than demand and supply tension sets the profit and the price. Um, you know, if I said to you, I know of a terrible, horrible, tiny little house down the road that just sold for 5 million pounds, you know that obviously there must have been lots of people who wanted that property. Um, it must be in a particular location that developers are trying to develop. There's got to be a reason where demand and supply tension pushed the price up. Um, so ultimately, you know, we know that demand and supply is everything. Um, and, you know, nothing else really, <laughs> nothing else really matters. So if you want to have for high prices and profitability, you're going to need a lot of leads. How, um, how, do, how do we... How do we create our own demand, our own market, I suppose, leaning on blue ocean strategy in, in many respects in terms of um, evangelizing about something that people don't even know they need yet? Yeah, well, this is the thing. In order to get enough leads, you have to go upstream to people who don't know. It's, there's, there's something called solution aware and problem aware. So solution aware is when someone knows that they want to buy a guitar. And problem aware is someone feels that they don't have any good hobbies and they want to do something that's interesting, but they're not sure what, um, you know, so you need to go to problem aware people, uh, not solution aware people, if you want more leads, because there's a lot more people who are problem aware and there's a tiny number of people who are solution aware at any given time. So, um, so, you know, if you imagine Centre Court at Wimbledon, 16,000 people. You step onto Centre Court, you say, who here is currently shopping for a new car? Tiny percentage of people would be currently shopping for a new car. Who here does not rate their current car as 100% perfect? Um, and a lot of people would say, I don't rate my car as 100% perfect. So if you can start with people's slight problems or frustrations and, and grow upon that and get in early, then you're, you're, you're much more likely to make a lot of sales and scale. And this comes back and it's a, a nod to our uh, seventh principle, which is proposition. You're either solving a problem or you're servicing a need. And uh, what we're saying is actually the being that, that pain detective, as Joe yes, Polish said in the show, and I, I, well, I can't take credit for it. He, he, Joe Polish mentioned this kind of phrase of being that pain detective that yeah. forensic about identifying and unearthing people's struggles is so critically important. How have you gone about that and how should our listeners practically go? So about next layer that? down. So the top level thinking is demand and supply sets the price. The next layer down is campaigns. So campaigns, each business needs to be running campaigns. Um, so, uh, I have three campaigns that I recommend. So at a very baseline sales driven campaign is what we call the perfect repeatable week. Um, and that is basically we, every single week we do things that generate leads, end up as appointments, present a value proposition, and then make sales, right? So we call that our weekly laps, leads, appointments, presentations, and sales. Um, and we have campaigns that are specifically designed to generate leads this week book into appointments this week, have a presentation and a sale either this week or next. And it's like laps, 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 laps. And we just crank the handle, crank the handle, crank the handle, crank the handle. Um, and those are the weekly laps. So those campaigns are designed to be, you, you might hear them called lead magnets or, um, you know, opt-in pages or any of those sorts of things, but you're running ads and you're running campaigns and you're doing everything to just generate a perfect repeatable week that's that just can be run over and over and over again and is is this industry agnostic daniel is it regardless of whether you're yep. selling a product yep. service uh, where you're selling what you're selling it's you yeah know. give me give me an industry and i'll give you an example well i came from the construction industry was my was my previous business and and we were selling large scale multi-million pound projects incredibly yep. long lead times so let's so let's say you did something called a developer boardroom where you get developers together or you get project funding together or you get people in the industry together and you have a um, a really nice lunch at a five-star restaurant, at a Michelin-star restaurant. And what you might do is just have twice a week that you've got private dining booked and you've got a team whose job is to get people in the room um, and to have a private dining experience, eight to 12 people, and then um, uh, you build the relationship. You have a you you break bread. You have a have a have a lunch, and then you might during the lunch 
explain what capability your company has and what projects you've worked on and what awards you've won, and then essentially make time to follow up to discuss any upcoming projects. Um, and that might be a twice a twice a month thing. We get eight people in the in the private dining, and we just smash it out and smash it out and smash it out. And we got someone whose job is to reach out and get people in that private dining room. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, and we did a version of that, and it wasn't as uh, frequent as as twice a month, but uh, certainly. Uh, well, just what... pausing on that, this is something hilarious that all businesses do. They do something that works, yeah. and then they don't repeat it every week um and it's funny because someone might say oh well you can't do it in ireland every week and i say okay jump on a plane and come to london then jump on a plane and come to manchester and jump or set up a local person whose job is to do it in uh you know manchester and bristol and bath you know and like have a little local two-person team whose job is to present and sell twice a month um makes complete sense you know, so let's, let's do it every week. If it works, if you go to a well, stick a bucket down the well and up comes clean water, uh, stick the bucket straight back down the well. Keep going back to the well. So this is the, this is the context of kind of the perfect repeatable weeks. Find out what works for you and keep doing more of it. Keep doing really. it. Yeah. yeah. So, so campaigns, what, what else? The other campaign is called a spotlight. So a spotlight is quarterly. Um, and that's where you showcase something special. You do something out of the ordinary, something different. Um, and, you know, you might get a guest speaker. You might do a close. If you're a retail store, you might do a closed store sale. Um, you're doing something. You, you might do a product launch. So, for example, Apple, they have perfect repeatable weeks in their retail stores. Um, so they really engineer those retail stores to just be selling, 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 selling. But then every quarter they do an online event. They just did one recently where they announced some new laptops and some new desktops. Um, so those those special spotlight events, they do product launches. Um, they bring in special guests uh, to the product launches. They make a big fuss about it and then they get back to their perfect repeatable weeks. So these are quarterly spotlights. What else? And the third one is the annual big messages. So the annual big message is you pick a theme for the year and you just bang on about it on social media. Um, and you're just putting out content constantly, building building cloud cover, building brand, building relationship. When someone Googles you, they see all the stuff you're doing on social media and it's all coherent. It's a, the annual coherent message. Um, and it's on, it's on two or three of the major social media platforms. If you're a small business, you pick one and just dominate it, right? So maybe you say, okay, we're just a YouTube, very, very YouTube focused, or you might say we're LinkedIn focused. So we're just going to dominate and we're going to post three or four times a week, really good content. We're going to pick a theme. We're not going to deviate. We're not going to get excited by the thing of the day. We're just going to be, you know, so you don't use your social media to comment on politics or world events or any of that sort of stuff. You just come in and just do a good, solid, um, repeatable, uh, big message that gets talked about in different ways. You do case studies and stories and, uh, you know, analogies and examples, and you just build that kind of community cloud cover. It reminds me of something I heard recently, a speaker on our own program says, if you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. So, you know, it's that annual big messages. Uh, that and annual importantly, big messages. it's also not about, it's not about sales. Mm -hmm. So you want to avoid talking about like the nitty gritty of, uh, of, Hey, today we've got a new laptop or this is what we do. Or, you know, it's, it's the, like, if you're Apple, your big message should be about creators and creatives and people who are changing the world. Like a great example was the Steve Jobs um, campaign called Think Different. So his, his big cloud cover was the idea that Apple users think different. They're crazy enough to change the world. They're the rebels and the misfits, right? So he did that cloud cover and it didn't talk about the computers at all, Um yeah, uh, that resonates so strongly. Something that, something that I picked up in 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 your book is this concept of seven eleven four. I think I've got that right in terms of the mm -hmm. the contact time with a potential customer that must happen before that that lead is actually converted into a customer. Can you share with our listeners what that is and the relevance in the context of of, of campaigns? 
Yeah, so multiple uh, research projects have been done around the way people bond and the way people feel that they trust you and that they want to, they feel connection to you. And it tends to be that within a relatively short space of time, call it three months, um, you clock up seven hours, 11 interactions or four locations with people. So for example, if you and I saw each other uh, in London, right? So we've had a Zoom call. If we saw each other on in London, that's location number two. Uh, if I was to watch one of your videos on, on YouTube, there's location number three. If we follow each other on LinkedIn, there's location number four. And at that point, I'm knowing you, liking you, trusting you. Um, if I listen to several episodes and it added up to seven hours over three months. There we go. I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm really, you're on my radar. Um, if we had 11 interactions, little emails, social media, a bit of text messaging, you're on my radar. So you essentially think that every 90 days, you're seven, 11, fouring people. Um, you're clocking up seven hours, 11 interactions, four locations. And, um, uh, you know, that those are the people who are likely to buy. And then ultimately as well, if someone becomes interested in you, they go through a content binging cycle where they want to know more about you. So they need the rabbit hole to run down. So for example, when I get excited about a product, I go through a feverish week of looking at the product and looking at alternatives and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, like this guitar behind me, a Fender Stratocaster. Beautiful, beautiful, by the beautiful way. Beautiful guitar, yeah. right? It's a, it's a really nice one. Yeah. It's an ultra. I'm salivating at the mouth here. Yeah. Yeah. So in the lead up to purchasing that, I'm looking at YouTube videos about that guitar. I'm looking at some alternative colors and a few designs. Um, I'm going on to different review sites. I'm looking at professional guitarists and what they say about that guitar. So I go through like several quick deep dives into that. And then I go, oh yeah, this is definitely the one that I want. And then I buy it and I feel that excitement that it's on its way. Um, so people buy in that way. So in the lead up to someone being right on the edge of saying, yes, I want to do your accelerator program, they want to go and have a little bit of a deep dive and they want to have access to as much as seven hours or 11 interactions worth of stuff. So if you're not deep dive ready, if you're not binge ready, you're missing out on a huge number of people who that's just how they buy. If you don't give them the stuff to binge on, they can't buy. And this is a nod back to one of your other books, one of your earlier books, which is becoming that key person of influence. And I'm assuming, you know, the, the, the person there could be the company in terms of the, the company persona, as opposed to just the no. person themselves. Okay. Company tell me, tell me about that. Company personas don't work very well at all. Um, so I'll give you an example. Cristiano Ronaldo, 500, 600 million followers. Every single football club combined has less than 200 million followers. Um, so these are 100-year-old clubs and brands. No one cares as much as they care about a particular footballer. Um, you know, the reason that we like Apple was first Steve Jobs and today it's Tim Cook. The reason we like Tesla is because of Elon. Um, if you cannot build a faceless brand, no one's going to care. No one's going to connect. We don't connect with, we don't connect with brands. Um, tell, tell me, tell me more about that, Daniel. It, you know, a lot of our listeners will be uh, leaders of SMEs who, for the yeah, large they, part, they, are very uncomfortable with, um, you know, stepping out and putting yeah. their face. Uh, the as, market just doesn't care whether you're comfortable or not. Right. Um, you can sit, you can sit there and say, "Oh, I'm not comfortable filing my taxes." Yeah. Um, you know, I just don't really like doing spreadsheets, and I don't like numbers, so I'm just going to tell HMRC that I'm not going to do my taxes because I'm not comfortable with it. And HMRC is going to say, "Well, that's not how it works. Sorry, Bucko. Uh, you're going to have to file your taxes anyway." Um, and the same thing as the market, you go, oh, I'm not really comfortable putting my face out there as a founder. Okay, fine. But whoever is comfortable is winning that business. And you, you are going to sit there in your vehicle that has no fuel in it, sitting there, oh, I'm not comfortable putting fuel in my tank. I just don't like getting out of the car and putting fuel into my car. So I'm just going to drive around on empty until it crashes, till it comes to a stop. Okay, fine. Right. No one cares whether you're comfortable or not. No one cares. Oh, that's a strong message for <laughs> for the bulk of our listeners today. That what would you say to people? You know, we were 
we were having a conversation before we started about the challenge, certainly in the UK and globally, there's 400 million SMEs globally. There's 5.7 million SMEs mm. in the UK. You know, they're, they touch every corner of society. More than 90% of people who are working mm. are working for SMEs. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the are more than 90% of businesses by volume are SMEs, more than 70% of people are in the workforce are working for SMEs. The and less yet less than 1% of those SMEs are achieving scale. What we're saying here was well, sorry at what I'm interpreting is that in order to in order to scale, this is a component that you need to actually step step out and and be yeah. the face of your business there's no question you don't have to be an influencer no one wants to see your gym routine no one wants to see your abs <laughs> no one wants to see you know you in your yoga pants or no one wants to not even my breakfast. cold plunges no no one wants to see cold plunges no one wants to see your breakfast routine your breakfast meal right we want key people of influence to be shining a spotlight on something important we don't want people who chase the spotlight no one likes a narcissist so if you're running around saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, you're doing the wrong thing. You should be running around saying, look at this thing, right? So let's say you've got a fitness brand. You should say, look at this person who transformed their fitness. Let's say you've got a, um, a construction company. Look at the before and after of this. Um, look at this building that we transformed. Uh, so you're, you're telling stories and you're out there, but you have to be the storyteller. There is no person, there is no company brand. Forget the idea of a company brand. Not let's take Nike, right? Nike is considered to be one of the, the top brands in the world. Well, when they first started, it was co-founded by Bill Bauman, who wrote a book called Jogging, and a million people read that book or bought that book. Um, and Phil Knight really leveraged that. And he was out there selling these things face-to-face -face with people as well. Uh, and he was known as the shoe dog, and he went to all the things. And then they started signing athletes to be the face of the brand so that they could scale into multiple um, things. So they, they pioneered jogging with the co-founder and then they, you know, obviously Michael Jordan with basketball and Serena Williams with tennis and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they take off with a face to the brand. Nespresso took off once they stuck George Clooney's face on the coffee machine. So we, we just don't care about brands. We don't care about them unless there's a person attached uh so if you're if you don't have a george clooney budget you're gonna have to be george clooney sorry <laughs> oh no uh what i'm hearing from that though importantly is is not necessarily the spotlight on us in the context of us becoming an influencer but actually showcasing those who have experienced our product or service those who are able to articulate the problem that we've solved or this the, the need that we've met by virtue of our service yeah and what we're playing there am i am i in am i inferring this right what we're playing here is kind of we're being the star maker not the star we're showcasing and sign people signposting yes. people to what we're doing and we're narrating the story and all of those things don't think that you can get away with just sticking your happy customers on a camera and putting them out there. You need someone who's genuinely narrating the, like people want to know the founder. It's so simple. It's so, so simple. If, if I told you that there's a Gordon Ramsay restaurant opening up down the street, you would probably book in and go and you say, Oh, you know, let's go to, to the new Gordon Ramsay restaurant. Now, the funny thing is you don't expect Gordon to be there. You don't you don't poke your head in the kitchen to see if Gordon Ramsay's actually in there. Um, you you'd be shocked if he was there. You'd be like, oh wow, I didn't expect to, I didn't expect to see you there. Um, and yet that restaurant would be full. Why? Because it's a Gordon Ramsay restaurant. Um, now the the thing is is that you know we don't even expect him to be there, but we want to know that he, we want to know he's behind it. We want to know who's the the person behind it. Same sort of thing, uh, you know, I have gotten, I have seen restaurants that take off. If you ever see a restaurant that takes off on a small scale, the founder, the owner gets out and talks to the customers. Um, you know, they're there. How was your night tonight? Tell me about it. Did you have a good, good evening? You know, so let true. me, let me, let me get you a little dessert. It's on me. People just love that stuff. So, so true. Before we get into the, the, the score up marketing and, and I'd, I'd 
love you to share with our listeners because it'll be relevant for many of our listeners in terms of the application of this of, of this uh, product that you've developed. But um, anything else that you want to leave the listeners with other than me appealing to them to buy your book, oversubscribe, <laughs> but uh, uh, practically in terms of actually uh, generating more leads, Daniel? Yeah, let me give you some tactics. So uh, tactic number one, really powerful, is never launch anything directly until you've launched the waiting list. So you must always launch a waiting list. And you can launch waiting lists multiple times. What do you mean so, by that? Well, for example, I would never promote your accelerator unless I promoted the waiting list to get on the accelerator first. Um, I would never promote a new book without having a waiting list first for people to buy the book and get on the waiting list before they buy the book. Um, I would never go into a new year without having a join the waiting list to become a client in 2024. Um, you know, next year we're going to get busy, join the wait list. So join the wait list is one of the most low hanging fruit campaigns you could possibly run. Um, any, any update whatsoever to your product or service should have a join the wait list. So if you're planning on having AI embedded into anything you do, join the wait list for the AI version. Um, uh, if you're planning on, you know, making it better, faster, cheaper, hotter, colder, you know, safer, right? Join the wait list for the shorter version, the longer version, the this, the that, the other, right? So it's like join the wait list is one of the fastest and easiest campaigns to just smash and win um, because it just requires such a low threshold for people to signal yeah. intent. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so that would be tactic one. Um, tactic number two is a regular introduction workshop, an introduction to blank. So if I was running your business, I would implement a weekly introduction to scaling. Um, so every Wednesday, introduction to scaling, um, our head of scaling development is going to go through the, the core principles. And we run that every single week, whether it's 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, it's an introduction to scaling. Um Tactic three would be a discussion group. So um, connect with other people looking to achieve blank. Connect with other people looking to scale their companies. We're doing a seven-day discussion group or we're doing a uh, December, January discussion group. Um, if you're interested in scaling up, join our discussion group, expert-led content, recommendations, join the discussion group. Um, and it's on WhatsApp. Uh, and then tactic number four is an assessment. So this is one of the, probably the most effective for making sales. So the other ones are more effective for just getting a volume of leads, but probably the most effective for qualifying and converting would be the assessment. And this is, are you ready to blank? Answer 10 questions to find out. Are you ready to scale? Uh, answer 10 questions to find out. Um, are you ready to run your first marathon? Answer 10 questions to find out. Uh, so it's basically a simple assessment um, and in there, you ask qualifying questions that help you to understand where that customer is and help you to kind of put them into segments. Uh, and uh, and then you communicate based on the segments. So those would be the four tactics I'd, I'd recommend. And that's a beautiful segue into uh, your wonderful new app, uh, Score App, uh, in terms of actually drilling deeply into the, or enabling people to actually uh, provide that assessment capability. So uh, can you can you share with us, Daniel, a little bit of the background in terms of you identifying, I suppose, discovering this first and identifying the scalable opportunity for this, yeah. for you now to actually direct your energy and resources into uh, bringing It goes right back to 2007 when we worked with this guy called Roger Hamilton who launched a book about wealth personalities and he, it was called Wealth Dynamics. And I was in charge of running this Wealth Dynamics profile test and people were paying a hundred US dollars to take a test. And we were making like four or 500 grand a year worth of sales for people to find out which Wealth Dynamics profile they were. And- What do you mean then, by Wealth Dynamics? Well, basically he had identified there were eight ways to making money, eight wealth personalities. So, um, on the extrovert end, you would be a star or a, or, a, um, or a leader of people. On the introvert end, you'd be a landlord or you'd be a uh, business systemizer, right? So he had he had a, okay. a model. 
And you had to take a personality test to find out what wealth strategy was was best suited to your personality. So we were getting four or 500 grand worth of people taking these. But then on top of that, we changed our marketing approach for each one of the eight strategies. So for anyone who came out as a star, we'd start talking about status and achievement and public recognition. Um, and then we'd completely change that for anyone who was a lord or an accumulator. So, so this was my first experience with it. Then when I wrote my book, Key Person of Influence, I went, oh, wait a second. I need to have a, of course, I need to have a key person of influence test. So I launched the key KPI scorecard um, to find out whether you're a key person of influence and how to become more of a key person of influence and what to do. Um, but I didn't make it chargeable. I just made it free. And we generated like 90,000 leads, 15 million pounds came in. Um, and it was basically answer 40 questions and get um, get a, a report. And that report became the backbone of our sales process. So when we'd, when we'd talk to people, we'd just get them to pull up the report and we'd have it in front of us and they'd have it in front of them. And we'd say, hey, look, it looks like you're really weak for pitching. You got a three out of 10. Um, what are you doing to improve your pitching skills? Uh, I haven't got a plan. Okay, well, let's put that in. Um, so we just talk about the things that they want to improve. And it was like conversions, 5X, uh, you know, and the speed to conversion, you know, was so much faster. So basically I launched three or four more of these. I launched the 24 assets scorecard. I launched the oversubscribe scorecard. Um, and we were just basically making tons of money off the back of these things and like just shocked that no one was using them. And then a few friends started saying, how do you build these scorecards? They seem pretty good. <laughs> um, and I said, I said, well, it's about 10 grand and about six weeks worth of writing up all the content. So I did about, I don't know, 10 of these for different friends. And then we thought, wait a second, this should be a platform rather than cobbling together WordPress and this, that, yeah. and, you know, all of these things. We want to build a platform. So we went and built the platform and then we start getting hundreds of people signing up. But obviously the complaint is it still takes hours to set these things up, maybe days or even a week or so. You've got to write a lot of content and do a lot of thinking. So we were going along pretty well. And we had, I don't know, a thousand clients when AI came along. Um, and then AI came along and took it from six six days to six minutes. Um, so you, you give the AI a few, a few pointers and then it writes over a thousand words and organizes it and codes the website and codes the questions up and builds the dynamic results page and builds the report and suddenly, and then it also writes email, uh, campaigns just for that person. And it creates press releases about the data. So we basically plug in the AI and then suddenly everyone goes, oh, wow. So now I can get this thing without any hard work. Okay, great. So we've just exploded uh, since the AI came along because it just does everything for you. Um, and also we've just recently introduced capability to launch wait lists. Uh, we've launched capability to um, get people to opt in for a discussion group and get, the, get in the WhatsApp. So all of those tactics, we've stuck them into score up as templates. Uh, as well. But look, it's all based upon, you probably sit there, a cynical listener might say, oh, he just talked about those things because they're in score app. It's like, no, no, I've been talking about those things for yeah. years, but people don't have the ability to implement them and they get stuck. So we've brought those in as templates so that people can implement those ideas, but those ideas predate by 20 years. <laughs> those things have been working for 20 years uh, and we've just made it super simple. And you can do it if you don't want to use score app, do it a different way. Um, but score app is like the way to do it in five minutes and get these things set up real fast. Yeah. Because, you know, when you list out the four tactics there, you know, that, that makes sense, but for the, and anyone listening to this go, oh, yeah, of course, you know, but they'll stop listening to this and go back into the busyness of their day to day. Yes. Uh, so yeah. what score app is doing is actually enabling you to, to, um, execute on these and implement these four tactics without you having to do a huge amount of work and effort. Uh, yeah, they're all templates and they've got AI plugged in. So the smallest amount of effort and you've got yourself that campaign ready to go. So what's the vision for, for score app then you must be hugely excited. I mean, in terms of the potential for this. Yeah. So everything that I do is developing entrepreneurs to stand out, scale up and make a positive impact. Yeah. So like it all goes back to that theme. 
And Score App is a important and powerful tool for allowing people to do that. It's that it is a very, it's a great tool for getting the intellectual property out of somebody's head and into a format that allows them to run a successful campaign and scale, scale up, stand out, scale up. Yeah. Um, so, um, so the vision is, you know, for me personally, it's about building businesses and tools that help fulfill on that mission. I, I wrote a book called Entrepreneur Revolution. I really believe this is a magical moment to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think AI is a turning point for humanity. Um, it's as significant as the agricultural or industrial age. Um, it's as significant as probably discovering the wheel or fire. Um, and, you know, here we are alive at this particular moment in time. And um, yeah, I just want to help people to make the most of the times that we're in. Um, so there's there's a big vision there. Obviously, it'll be a hundred million dollar plus business, which is great. Um, but um, you know, but that that's a fun way to keep score. But ultimately, it's it's cool business to help a lot of people build a business. Before we move into the close, Daniel, this, this the last hour has absolutely flown. I I I would. I, uh, appeal to you to get you back on again. There's so much, uh, I, 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 I'm even, I'm careful, conscious of time, not to open up the whole AI discussion, but I'm sensing given what you've, you've said and what you've articulated about how it has supported score app and the development of that mm. you're, you're hugely positive about AI. I just yes. want to, to dig in a little bit, um, into your purpose, you know, the, you know, you, you, you've said it a number of times now, what has been the catalyst to that? You know, what, what, why, why, why is this important to you? Well, there's a number of reasons. If you go back through all of human history, humans are very entrepreneurial. We, we are there, there's a natural state where we love to serve others, help others. And we love to get rewards for that. Um, you know, we love, you look at little kids they love the basics of doing something for somebody else and getting rewarded. Um, and really a lot of that is the, the fundamental building blocks of entrepreneurship. I think entrepreneurship is, our, is a very human state. And I don't just mean the founder. I mean like working together in an entrepreneurial venture. I think it's very unnatural to live, to, to live and work in the corporate environment and some of the industrial revolution structures that we came up with. Um, and I think that entrepreneurship is probably the greatest ability to make positive change in the world. Um, you know, entrepreneurs come up with scalable solutions. We come up with ways to solve a problem today, tomorrow, next week, and then even bigger, you know, in a year. Um, and we come up with ways that generate surplus energy. So if we think of money as just energy, an entrepreneur is coming up with a way of solving a problem so that there is a surplus created that then scales that into more people's lives so for me it's about finding a tribe of people who want to use entrepreneurship as a vehicle for making positive impacts um there's a like there's a bit of a genesis story for me which is i achieved success in business at a pretty damn young age you know we we're doing 10 million before i was 25 um and um i i became i did some traveling and i became aware that there was a lot of problems in the world um, you know, I went into rural Uganda and I spent time with the CEO of the hunger project. And, um, you know, I went into a charity in the slums in India and, um, you know, environmental destructions always hit pretty hard, um, on my heartstrings. And basically I started realizing there's just so many problems around and, um, and I started thinking, well, what am, what am I going to do? Like, what problem do I pick and solve that is a good problem for me to pick and solve? So I kind of really started thinking about, like, you know, maybe getting involved in, like, the education system and doing stuff with, you know, um, kids as they're going through school. And I looked at all sorts of different things. And I eventually rested on this idea. If I could develop uh, thousands of entrepreneurs who each use their business as a force for good, and if I could tilt them in that direction, then the flow on impact would be massive. And I also heard a quote, which was that you can achieve a lot if you don't care about who gets the credit. So um, if I could create an entrepreneur accelerator called Dent, where other people get to go out and get the credit for the amazing work their business does. But if it was me that tipped them in that direction, I can feel good about that as well. Um, so so basically that's that's where it all came from i love that 
Daniel, you're such a, a wise man and such a young man. Uh, you've you've had, and I would I I would contend that a lot of this, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe. Clearly, you were sending something out as a young nineteen year old, which which uh, at, was attractive to John in terms of your capability, your attitude, your energy, all of that. So I don't think you know, and we can say, well, it was good fortune, you know, you met John, but. Um, you're an incredibly capable guy. You know, I encourage people who are listening to to, to go down the rabbit hole of what, what you're doing, read your stuff. Um, can you share with our audience today three timeless takeaways? We talked about them with our, um, with our maxims, right? So let me give you a few maxims that I think are, are timeless. So the first maxim is you're standing on a mountain of value. Um, and that maxim is all about the fact that right underneath you is this huge amount of value. But when you're standing on top of a mountain, you lose perspective of the mountain. You can actually see everything but a mountain. If ever you've stood on a mountain and you've got to the summit, <laughs> so you true. can see you can see everything other than the mountain. So this is something called proximity bias, which is the inability to see what you're standing closely to. Um, so one of the first things that I always talk to people about is that you probably want to chase success but what you will discover is that it's right under your feet so there's a story there's a case study there's a um there's something that's been in uh, already unfolding for the last 10 20 years that's ready to happen um and when you tune into the thing that's under your the mountain of value that you're already standing on when you tune into that that's when the magic really happens. When you chase, nothing happens. You get exhausted chasing. So, so that would be a bit of timeless wisdom. The next one would be you get what you pitch for, you're always pitching. So you get what you pitch for is that the journey of successful entrepreneurship is essentially a journey of a thousand pitches. You're either going to be pitching people regularly, in which case you can do it in three to five years, or you're not going to be pitching people very often, which means it'll take 20 or 30 years. Um, but ultimately you're going to have to do a thousand great pitches and you're pitching things into existence. So for example, if I were to pitch to you, I'm a financial planner. I help anyone with their finances and I will happily take a look at whatever you want to take a look at. That's definitely going to pitch me into being a middle of the road, boring financial planner who earns a very average amount of money. If I were just to say, I'm a, I'm a financial planner, I'm incredibly passionate about rural families who own farms. I work with farming families to secure their farm for the next two generations. Um, and I do things like create um, code, codes of values. And um, like we, we actually almost set up a family office structure for farming families. And we've identified all the best practices for a rural family that owns a farm to pass that on successfully. That's going to put me in the case of being a globally recognized leader in that field who um, who has clients all over the world who have multi-hundred million dollar rural businesses. So if I pitch that for 10 years, I'm going to end up with a very different business than the first one. So the idea is you get what you pitch for. And then you're always pitching is that you can't switch it off. So if you say times are tough, you're going to pitch into existence times are tough. Um, if you say there's no good employees in this industry, you're going to get no good employees. <laughs> so you pitch into existence everything you pitch. You can't switch this thing off. You can't say, oh, when I'm in front of people, that's when I do great pitches. But behind the scenes, I, I slag off about people and say bad things about my industry. It's it's all a pitch, everything. So you 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 got to get you got to get comfortable with the idea that anything that comes out of your mouth added to it, add a little bit of inspiration and emotion to it, uh, it, you're pitching that into existence. Oh my goodness. Um, so, so profound and everything that you say just resonates so, so strongly. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation today. Uh, what's next for you, Daniel, then is the, is the focus of your energy. You know, we've only 24 hours uh, in, in a day is the focus of your energy and in, in score app. Uh, yeah, so score. I, I, there's the whole group of companies, and I, you know, I do my high value thing across all of them, um, and I've got an amazing team who does does their high value thing. Um, 
uh, but we're launching Book Magic, which is author tools for um, AI-driven author tools. So writing a book and having effectively having someone who's brainstorming the book mm -hmm. with you while you write it. Um, so that's bookmagic.ai. Um, and, you know, AI is a major focus for me at the moment. I want to have multiple AI businesses and I'm, I'm noticing what AI's capabilities are and, uh, you know, I'm going all in on that and, and loving it. Um, and yeah, essentially, you know, for me, I'm in my forties, I've got a young family and it's like, I'm just very aware of the fact that this is a magical moment that I need to strike the right balance between time with kids and, and making the most of my peak earning years. And, um, and, you know, I've got all this creative energy and just basically making sure I don't spread myself too thin, but, you know, get it right effectively. Well, look, with all of that, I, I want to thank you for uh, serving our audience today, for your time, your energy, your incredible wisdom. Uh, so look, if anyone wants to to reach you, Daniel, to, to connect with you, to find out more, where best to reach you? Uh, well, there's the books. So there's the four books uh, ranging Entrepreneur Revolution, Key Person of Influence, Oversubscribed and 24 Assets. Those are on Amazon um, and Audible. Um, there's my social media. I'm very active on LinkedIn at the moment. So adding me on LinkedIn, um, is totally cool. Uh, and I'm posting lots of stuff on LinkedIn. Um, I'm putting weekly videos on YouTube as well, just as I learn stuff, sticking it on, on YouTube. So, um, so there's, there's a good amount of stuff, uh, there. Um, so LinkedIn, YouTube, um, books, all of that. Brilliant. Well, look, I wish you every success with what you're doing um where you know our, our purposes are very very much aligned i i love it and uh, i'm 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 excited about learning more and hopefully we'll get you back on the show another time so brilliant i'm looking forward to it brilliant look take care thanks daniel cheers